My brothers and sisters in the Lord, you should know three things about me as I stand here tonight as your pastor. First and foremost is this. I am a believer. I believe. I believe in the testimony that Jesus Christ gives us. I believe in the love that he offers us. I am a believer. I believe not only in the temporal matters of what happens in this world and the responsibility we have to these affairs, but I believe that there is yet a world to come and we will be held accountable for our actions in this life. I am a believer. Second, I love the church. I love the church. And my brothers and sisters, I'm not talking about the brick and mortar that makes up the institutions that surround and dot our great city. But I am talking about my brothers and sisters who through their baptism come together, come together to profess their faith in the person of Jesus Christ, who lives as a testimony to Jesus in this world, the people of God, the body of Christ. I love the church. And third, I know, my dear friends, and I am confident that God in Christ Jesus will not abandon us. He will not abandon the church which he has invested with the Holy Spirit to lead and guide us. He will not abandon us, my dear friends. For in love he gives testimony to the fact that he is with us yesterday, today, and forever. And it is Christ who we rely upon. It is the kingdom of God that we seek to establish in our world. Having said all this, my brothers and sisters, because I love the church, because I am a believer, and because I know Christ will not abandon us, I, as one who stands in the person of Christ the High Priest, accept the collective responsibility of the church that committed sin, of the individuals who, like the weeds planted in the soil, in the good soil, emerged and took advantage of those individuals who were innocent. I repent for the acts of sacrilege that took place within our own temples of the Lord, our own houses of the Lord God. And I beg pardon and forgiveness for the ways that human frailty and sinfulness have scarred the body of Christ through the ministerial priesthood. For that, my dear friends, for those actions, I apologize to everyone and anyone who is abused by someone in the church, especially those who are young, our children. I apologize to those whose hearts are broken, beaten, and bruised over the clergy sex abuse scandal that continues to rage in our local church and the acts of demonic desecration. My brothers and sisters, never should that have happened, and never should that ever be tolerated, never. And so therefore, we can never apologize enough to those who have been abused. We can never apologize enough because they were abused under the cloak of someone who claimed to represent and be a shepherd. We can never apologize enough and we can never repent enough for those sins. In the first reading, we heard the words of the prophet Joel. Even now, says the Lord, return to me with your whole heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your hearts and not your garments and return to the Lord your God. As I sat yesterday evening with this reading, I was invited to repent to grieve for the sins of abuse and sacrilege, to feel humiliation for the failure of the church, for my failures, to seek contrition and forgiveness, and to open my heart to Christ's love and gentle whispering of the Holy Spirit. Indeed, my friends, to ask forgiveness for the thousands of children who have been abused throughout the world. For you see, my dear friends, 
when all the new revelations were made manifest over the past few weeks, continuing even till today, it reopened the wounds for all of us, especially for those who had been violated. It reopens those wounds of the church. It calls us, my friends, to reflect again and remind ourselves of the vigilance that is needed and demanded for those who embrace Christ. Now, my dear friends, I know many of you here. I know your sense and your spirit. Let me say this to you. I myself am angered. I myself am frustrated. I myself am ashamed, embarrassed by these actions. And I share with you in your righteous indignation. But I ask you to take a look at the righteous indignation that caused Jesus to come into the temple and to drive out those money changers. My friends, Jesus came into the temple area and he saw those who were no longer following his father. Those who were no longer following his father in the temple. They were there for personal gain. They were there to take advantage. And here Jesus comes in and with righteous indignation, he drives them out. And I tell you, our righteous indignation should be like Jesus. And the fact that we should strive to restore the temple. We should strive to restore the church. Not tear it down. Not burn it to the ground. For you see, my friends, righteous indignation can cause us to place our needs, our wants, our desires in front of everything and everyone. And that, my friends, can be destructive. But it is that righteous indignation that calls us to restore the temple, to restore the order that should be in the temple, to restore the church, to restore the life and ministry of the priesthood. And when we examine, my brothers and sisters, that righteous indignation, we can see immediately that there is a loss of the sense of our rootedness in the presence of God. Because when we lose our sense of being rooted in the presence of God, my brothers and sisters, we turn away from him and we fall into sin. For you see, my dear friends, clerics who did what they did are no longer looking at their rootedness that was present in the God of the covenant. They were no longer looking at the responsibility they had to the truth proclaimed in the person of Jesus Christ. There could be many excuses that are offered, many excuses. But there is no doubt that one could not exchange the institution of the church over the destruction of the innocent. The problem is that once sin is rooted into the lives of a community, it is destructive. And we have seen that destruction happen. But you see, my friends, we cannot allow ourselves to take our righteous indignation and take our anger and allow it to be new weeds planted in the ground next to the wheat. We must do, what we must do is understand and re-examine what we should be cultivating. For you see, my friends, what we are called to cultivate is the wheat which is life-giving, the wheat which feeds us with new life, the wheat which is represented here at the altar of sacrifice given by Jesus himself, the wheat which is restorative for us as the people of God. We cannot take our anger, my brothers and sisters, or our shame or our hurts and bury them into the ground next to the weeds. What made the weeds so dangerous is that they looked so much like the wheat. But in reality, they serve their own purpose. Not the purpose which is called for by Jesus Christ in terms of reaching out in love and giving life to those in the community that need love and care. Remember, my brothers and sisters, that it was the very disciples who went before Jesus after he gave them a very hard saying about unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you shall not have life within you. Many people, my dear friends, walked away. And Jesus looked at his disciples and he said to them, do you wish to go also? 
And the response was, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. My friends, at this critical time in our local church, a critical time in our history, we have to remind ourselves of the words of Jesus which are life-giving. We have to remind ourselves of the teachings of Jesus and pledge ourselves to make sure that the rootedness of the person of Jesus Christ and the truth that he represents is clearly seen in our world. And we must do so in ourselves so that we are the testimony of the love of Christ which we proclaim. We have to be believers that call others to faith in love of the church and with an understanding that Christ does not abandon those he loves. And so, my dear friends, we are reminded, because we are believers, because we love the church, because we know that God never abandons his people, we believe this night that we will go forward. And we are going forward because there have been brave individuals who have offered their testimony, who have taken Christ's light and have allowed that light to shine brightly on areas of the church that are still in darkness. It was their stories that make us a different church today. And it will be their stories that will continue to be told, that will help us to continue to be vigilant, help us to understand our responsibility, assist us in being what the world needs us to be as torchbearers of Jesus. But you see, my brothers and sisters, we cannot do this alone. We have to do this together. We must do it embedded in faith and with God and our Lord Jesus Christ as our leader. The sins and iniquities that have wounded the body of Christ occurred because there were those who no longer saw Christ as the Good Shepherd who no longer saw their responsibility to him and to our brothers and sisters. I give you a new commandment, Jesus says, love one another as I have loved you. And so this night we ask God to take away our blindness, our deafness, our stubbornness, our vices and our pride. And through the sacraments of penance and Holy Eucharist, we pray that the divine physician manifests in each of us, in our local church, in our community here at Divine Mercy, in the church around the world, only that which is healing power may accomplish. And so tonight we pray, as people have prayed for thousands and thousands of years, be merciful, O Lord, for we have sinned. A clean heart create for me, O God, and a steadfast spirit renew within me. As a people of faith, my dear friends, we trust that God will bring good out of all of this, this immense suffering. And through his grace of forgiveness, may he make the church once again healthy and holy. And may he make us once again healthy and holy. And so before you this evening, we, your priests and your deacons, renew our promises to be co-workers of conversion, to teach and preach by our words and our actions the gospel of Jesus Christ. To faithfully and reverently celebrate the sacred mysteries for his glory and your sanctification. To pray for those who have been hurt as well as to pray for all. The people of God here at Divine Mercy and the faithful of the Archdiocese of New Orleans. And to pray, my friends, without ceasing. And with the help of God, we renew our promise to be united more closely every day to the heart of Jesus, the sacred heart of Jesus to Christ the High Priest. Tonight, my brothers and sisters, we commit ourselves to conversion and renewal, to repentance and new life. For even in times in which we stand in pain and long to see salvation, in those times we stand in need of guidance and protection, in those times, my friends, in which we stand and our heart is heavy and broken and bruised, we are tired and weary and we're worn. We know, my friends, that we stand together tonight as a people of God. 
We stand together as a parish family. We stand together in faith. We stand together in hope. We stand together in charity. And we walk by faith this day, my dear friends, not by sight. And there will be days, days that we experience now, days in the coming future, in which we'll have to walk by blind faith, putting one foot in front of the other and knowing, my brothers and sisters, and trusting and expecting that the best is yet to come. May we not bury, my, my friends, our pain, our anger, our embarrassment. May we not bury it into the ground. May we not allow it to become weeds. But may, by the grace of God, we become good wheat. May we be a people of conversion and repentance and renewal. May we reach out to those who are hurting this day, those who are confused, those who are on the border of leaving the church based upon everything that has happened. May they see in us a renewal, that this is a time for all of us, my dear friends, to look at our own sinfulness, our own unfaithfulness, and ask the Lord for forgiveness and mercy, to walk this day in hope, to walk in faith, and to walk in love. Tonight, my brothers and sisters, you and I are witnesses of these things. Thank you.